and welcome to BCC Online. My name is Winona and the weather has been lovely as of late and I thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to remind you to follow us on all of our social media to stay up to date for all things BCC, such as our YouTube, our Facebook, our Instagram, as well as our website, BethelWPG.com. Thank you so much for your giving and if there are ways that you want to try out on how to give, check out our website on how to do all of that. Today we have Pastor Chris speaking to us and before we get into all of that, we're going to get ready to worship. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to have you here this morning. Wherever you are, if you're on a walk, you're in your kitchen, you're hanging out in the living room, it's so good to have you with us. We're going to worship our God together, so let's sing. Here in your light we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on this. Your glory on display. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. Here we go. You will be praised. Your love is source of grace, consuming every space, it's uncontainable. You're coming like a flood, our hearts are failing up, all things are possible. You believe it? All things are possible. Awesome in this place, Jesus you are awesome in this place. Sing it out this morning. Worthy to be praised, Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. Awesome in this place. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. One more time, let's sing it out. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We like the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We like the name of Jesus. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We like the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. Keep singing this morning. When nights fall, when feeling come, let's see 
you calling me One faith is lost and my hope exhausted You will be my strength With my mindset I'm not good enough God you're enough for me And I decided I'm not giving up You won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on It won't let go And I feel it breaking out Like an echo Your love is holding on It won't let go And I feel it breaking out Like an echo Echo in my soul surrender to you, Lord. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our joy. We surrender our peace. God, I just thank you that you are the giver. You give, Lord. God, we receive from you this morning. We worship you, Lord.
Will you this morning? All of creation praises him. The heavens and the earth are his. Will you praise him? Will, will you worship him? Will, will you bow down? Will you surrender? Will you give all that you have? Will you give all that you are for his glory, for his honor? Because that's what worship is. That's what worship is, is surrender. That's what worship is, is laying down our own ideas and aligning with the truth and the reality that everything is his, that he is so good, and that all we are and all we have belong to him. Will you? If all creation worships, if all creation acknowledges the lordship of Christ, will I? That's the question. That's the most important question you will ever answer. And it's a question we have to answer daily. We daily pick up our cross. We take up our cross and we follow him. Daily we lay down who we are, what we are, and what we have for him. And that is the life of worship. So Father, we just ask you to help us with that. We know that that is not in our nature. It does not come easily to us to lay down all that we have and all that we are. Our nature is to fight. Our nature is to elevate ourselves. 
Our nature is to be independent. But we just submit to you today. We submit to you and we lay down in front of you. We lay down before you. We kneel down. We place our hearts, our minds, and all we possess before you. And we just ask you, Lord, to do with it as you will. This is our worship today. And every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for allowing us into your home today. Thank you, worship team, for leading us so beautifully in honoring God today with our, with our bodies and with our mouths, with our hearts. I hope that you are able today to honor God with songs and uh, just the posture of your heart. We've been talking for the last number of weeks about making it count. How can we make our lives here on earth count? We've been talking about the fact that our lives are not guaranteed. We don't know about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we do have today, and we have what is in our hands. So I have a question for you today. What is the greatest treasure in the world? You can type in the chats what you think the answer to that is. What is the greatest treasure in the world? There's many possible answers you could come up with. There's massive diamonds and all kinds of stones, um, archaeological treasures, ancient things that are nearly invaluable or priceless. But I think for all of us individually, the reality is the greatest treasure in the world is yours. The greatest treasure in the world is the one that you have. My greatest treasure, the greatest treasure to me is the ones, the treasures in my hand. So today we're going to be talking about making it count. And we're going to be talking about treasure. The good news is we have all been given a lot. A lot of time. We've had a lot of time already. Talent. We've all got something. We've all got a skill, an ability, and we've all got treasure. And to whom much is given, much is required. And the bad news is we will be responsible. We will be held accountable. We are responsible for what we have. That's the bad news. The good news is we've been given a lot. The bad news is we will be held accountable. We are responsible for handling what's in our hand. Right at the beginning, God charged Adam. He said, I want you to take care of this garden. I want you to have dominion. I want you to have authority. I want you to be fruitful, and I want you to multiply. I don't just want you to take care of it. I want you to grow it. I want you to make it more. And in Matthew 25, we talked about the fact that there's a parable that talks about the ten virgins, talks about being ready for the Lord's return. And then there's a parable of the talents. And the parable of the talents isn't about talent. It's not about gift and ability. It's about money. Talk about money bags. A talent was a unit of wealth, like a dollar. Talents is money, it's wealth, it's treasure. And in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, it tells us how to be ready. It tells us how to use our time. We are called to steward. We are called to manage the treasure that has been put in our hands, the wealth that God has given us. So make it count. Make your treasure count. Whether you have a lot of treasure, whether you have a lot of wealth or just a little, the question doesn't change. The question is still, what will you do with it? And it's an important question. And for some of you, you're cringing because you don't like talking about money. You're repulsed by discussing how much you spend on something. You're offended when people ask you for money. You hate those, those pyramid schemes when you get invited to those teas or those parties because you know what it's going to lead to. So many people shy away from the subject, especially in church, especially because there's a history of manipulation and abuse when it comes to money in church. 
And this is incredibly unfortunate because money affects every area of our lives, including our spiritual lives. And to not deal with money biblically puts us at a huge disadvantage. According to an article I read in churchleaders.com, it says there are 500 Bible verses pertaining to faith and prayer. That's a lot of verses. To me, that says that faith and prayer are important. If the Bible talks about it a lot, it's probably important. 16 out of 38 of Jesus' parables deal with money and possessions. Nearly 25% of Jesus' words in the New Testament deal with biblical stewardship, taking care, managing what we have. One out of 10 verses in the Gospels deals with money. You know how many verses in the Bible there are on money, on wealth, and possessions? Just give it a guess right now. Just throw a number out there, any number. 2,350. 2,350 Bible verses on money. Jesus was not afraid to talk about money. And Jesus talked about money because he needed to talk about money. Jesus talked about money because we need to hear about money. Money can break marriages. Money can make divorces even messier. Money can split sibling relationships. Money can cause betrayal and all kinds of terrible things. Treasure is not something that we can ignore. And we shouldn't be intimidated to deal with it. It's simply a reality that we all live with. If you have, maybe you're feeling convicted already, if you have stewarded your money poorly, if you've not been a good manager of your money, that can stop today. And if you have done well, good for you. You can always be better. We can all be helped by these principles today. And there's a couple foundational things that I think we need to address before we get into the nitty gritty. One is the wealth of the world, yes, including yours, belongs to God. Make no mistake, just like everything else when it comes to stewardship, this is the basic principle of stewardship. Everything we have and everything we are belongs to God. And it is our worship to give back to him what it is he has given us. Psalm 50 verses 9 to 12 says, But I do not need bulls from your barns or goats from your pens, for all the animals in the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains, and all the animals in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. Don't you love that? Just in case you were thinking, I needed something from you, let's set the record straight and let me let you know, let me remind you that everything is mine. Our wealth is his wealth in our hands for just a short time. First Chronicles 29 says it this way, starting in verse 11. It says, everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. Somebody's got it right. Somebody gets it. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank your glorious name, but who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are only here for a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon and without a trace. Somebody got it. Somebody has reality grasped. And I wonder how often we do. How often do we have this reality grasped? How often are we conscious that what's ours isn't ours? What's ours is his. Secondly, when it comes to wealth, we need to understand that wealth is not evil. I think sometimes in this church, in the church, there is a, not this church, but the church, there is a common misconception 
that wealth is bad, that money is bad. It's not. For some reason, we have believed the lie that that money is associated with evil and pride and that poverty is somehow wholesome and, and humble. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, and it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. Having money is not evil. It's not even close to evil. It is a blessing. It is a tool put in your hand to do something with. And whether you use it for good or whether you use it for evil is up to you. And you will be responsible and held accountable when we face Jesus Christ for what we have done with it. And just look in scripture, just if, in case you don't believe me that money is not evil, look at Job. God said that Job was a righteous man. He was like the most upright man on the earth, and he was filthy, stinking rich. Abraham, the one that God called, the one that God singled out, sent him into the wilderness, filthy, stinking rich. He was not held accountable or or um, chastised for having money. In fact, it was given, and it was given as a blessing. In Egypt, when the Israelites left, what were they given? They were just given financial blessing. They were given gold. They were given everything. God was funding their trip. In fact, he was funding the nation of Israel. They were building a country in that moment. Look at the temple. The temple was extravagant. The temple was opulent. It's not evil. And just in case all of that is not enough, Revelation 5.12 says, and this is talking about the multitude in heaven, it says, and they sang a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy to receive riches. See, you can be bankrupt and love money and full of greed. And you can be rich and hold your wealth loosely and have a generous spirit. 1 Timothy 6.10 outlines very specifically what the problem with money is. The problem with money isn't money. The problem with money is, here's what it says, for the love of money the love of money, the love of it, is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It is loving money. It is making it your God. It is putting it above God and other better things that it becomes a problem that lures you away from faith. Money is not evil. The worship of money is evil. Letting it rule you is evil. So either we control money or it controls us. And too often, that's the fact. Too often it does control us, and we'll get into that in a little bit. The third thing is that wealth reveals our hearts. Wealth gives us a clue as to where we are like I said, it causes many relationships to sour, and maybe it's because sometimes we love money more than we love others. Maybe it's because sometimes we pursue money more than we pursue our relationships. When money is at stake, you will see people's true colors. The nasty comes out when there's money at stake, especially when someone thinks they have been taken advantage of. Greed is exposed. We see people fighting for what's mine, our rightful share. And you see that in business, you see it in family, you see it in friendship and marriage. Matthew 6, 19 to 21 says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths, cannot, moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Here is the key right here. Wherever your treasure is, 
the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, follow the money. Just follow it. It'll show you exactly what's going on in here. What are you spending your money on? It shows you. It's a, re- it's a mirror. It's reflecting what's going on. Your choosing is made visible on your credit card statement or in the pile of receipts. The eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light within you is darkness, how great the darkness. This seems confusing because it's talking about money, and then it talks about eyes, and then it talks about money again. Uh, from what I understand, there was a, uh, it's just like a figure of speech in, in Hebrew, and it was talking about greed. If you have an evil eye, that means you're greedy. What are you looking at? You're looking at what you're trying to get. If you're generous, you have a healthy eye. You have light in your eyes. You're generous. What you're seeing, what you're gazing upon. You're not envious. You're not covetous. You're not greedy. An evil eye was greed, but healthy eyes are generosity. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve both God. Some translations say mammon. And some other translations say money. You can't serve both God and money. You're only going to have one master. Mammon was a word for um, sort of money. It was sort of more of a word for the evil associated with money. But you can't serve both. So we have to make a choice. And we're either going to make a choice on purpose or we're going to make a choice kind of by accident. We're just kind of not going to choose and then it's going to lead us down a certain path. Who is your master? Is God your master? Or is money? Because it's not how much you have that matters, really. It's what you love. And it's what you do with what you've got. So what do you love? And how do you know? Follow the treasure. You may say you love knowledge. But if you don't spend money on books, if you don't spend money on subscriptions, if you don't take courses, if you don't attend seminars, if you don't take workshops, do you really love knowledge? You say you love your kids, but if you don't buy them food and you don't buy them clothes, and if you're able and you don't invest in building their skills, in their education, do you really love your kids? Your money will follow what you love. Your heart will be where your treasure is, which gives me hope because it means we can make decisions about what to do with our money and our hearts will follow. Because I don't know if you remember, but the Bible does say that our hearts can be pretty fickle, but we can make decisions that put us in a direction that we want to go. And wealth is no different. You've got this. You've got treasure. It might be just a little, It might be a lot, but you know what? He who is faithful in little things will be given more. About 10 years ago, I think Egan was a baby, I went through this really weird season. I would go shopping, I would go grocery shopping, I would just be out running errands, and I found that I was accidentally stealing all the time. Like almost every time I went out, almost every store I went to where I came out with something, I had something that I hadn't paid for. And at first I didn't think much of it. I was like, oh, so then I had this decision to make, right? I'm loading in my car. I see there's a little package of lunch meat between bags or between some, like my diaper bag or whatever. And I had this decision. What am I going to do with this? It's like a $5 package of meat. This is really annoying. I've got all my stuff in the car. I've got two little kids. It's 40 below. I could just put the lunch meat in the cart. I didn't mean to steal it on purpose. It was an innocent theft. Or I could go back and pay for it. So I went back and I paid for it. It happened over and over again. Sometimes I didn't go back and pay for it because I was so irritated that this person hadn't noticed. Or sometimes, to be honest with you, it had been in the thing and they didn't ring it through and somehow it came to my attention that it hadn't been paid for. So like when it was my own fault, I couldn't be that angry, but when it was their fault, it made me really angry. 
So sometimes I didn't go right back in and do it, but you know what I did do? I did take it next time I went. Remember one time I had a can of Alpha Getty. Like how did, how did a can of Alpha Getty not get paid for it? This is so annoying. So next time I went, it was like a week or two later, I just took it in and I said, you know what, I, just, I need to pay for this. I went home with it last time and I didn't pay for it. And that wasn't too painful when it was a $2 can of Alpha Getty or a $5 package of lunch meat, but I came home one time and I had bought four laundry baskets and they had only rung in three. And I had four of them on the counter and they only rung in three and it wasn't $2. It was more expensive. And at that time, I was a stay-at-home mom with two little kids. Rich and I, before we had kids, we both had a full-time job and we had investment income. So we were two people with three streams of income. It was pretty good. And then we had kids and we went down to one stream of income and investment income. Then we had another baby and then we made some investments. So we now had four mouths to feed and one stream of income. It was a shift. So going back and paying for the $2 can of Alpha Getty when I didn't have to, it hurt. Going back and paying for the $5 um, package of lunch meat, it hurt. But going back and paying for a $20 laundry basket when I had put it on the thing and they failed to ring it in, it hurt. Like, made me mad too. But what made me mad was I felt like it was a test. I felt like, because I'm telling you, it like happened 20 times, I felt like God was saying to me, can I trust you with the little things? Can I trust you with the small things? Do you have integrity? The things that aren't even your fault or the things that no one else will see, can I trust you to do what's right. And so I did my best. One day, I was at a store. I had a big item that I was, a big pot that I was paying for. I don't know how this person did this. They did not ring through the pot. It's a big pot. It was on the counter. And I said to God, I got home. And I realized, and I said, you know what? I'm so done. It's like a 30-minute drive to go back. I don't plan on going back to the store. I'm so tired of this. I'm done. Please stop. And that was it. And the season was over. And I don't know if I passed or if I failed, but I was so done. When we are faithful with the little things, we show God whether or not we can handle more. And that, that's true for everything, not just our money. That's true with our families. That's true with our time. That's true with our, our skill and our ability. What are you going to do with it? And can he trust you? Can he trust, if he gives it to you, can he trust you? So there's no way we can look at 2,350 scriptures today, although I'd like to. Um, we're just going to look at a few. There's one person in the Bible that um, is called the wisest man to ever have lived. And he was filthy, stinking rich. He was blessed. And that was King David's son, Solomon. And he had influence, he had wisdom, he had wealth, he had power. It, said, it says in 1 Kings 3.10, the Lord was pleased with Solomon that he had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have and I will also give to you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. So we're going to learn from one specific person in the Bible today. Out of all the 2,350 verses we could learn from, we're going to look at Solomon. We're going to look at what he said about wealth and wisdom. 
And so we're going to look at seven lessons on treasure from the wisest man to ever live. So if you want to learn about this, um, this is like a note-taking Sunday for sure. We're going to drink from a fire hydrant, and we're going to go through fast. And so if you have a pen and paper, this is time to take notes. If you're watching online, which you must be because this is the only way you're watching this morning, um, you might want to watch it again and take notes if you're not prepared. So here's what, here's, here's, this is, this is it. We're going to, you know, fasten your seatbelt. Let's go. In order to manage our treasure well, in order to make the most of what we've got, because you've got it, you've got this, it's in your hand, in order to make it count, seven things. Number one, turn away from greed. Do not give greed a place. Proverbs 119, such is the fate of all who are greedy for money, it robs them of life. How's that for some incentive? Don't be greedy, it will rob you of life. Proverbs 28, 22, greedy people try to get rich quick, but don't realize they are headed for poverty. And just to throw in some words of Jesus, then he said in Luke 12, 15, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So whether or not you have a lot, the message is the same. Use it well. Don't be greedy. Philippians 4, 10 to 15 says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. This is the Apostle Paul. I know that you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. With whether I've got a lot, whether I've got a little, I have learned to be content. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation. This is good words right here. Whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. In Christ, you have the power to live with next to nothing. In Christ, you have the power to use your wealth well. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. Regardless of Paul's bank account, little bag on his hip, whatever it was, he was still on a mission, and his mission wasn't affected. He was able to do what he needed to do, whether he had a lot or a little, because Christ empowered him to. The best way to reject greed is this one. This is number two. Be a giver. Number two is be a giver. Give to God what is his. Your tithe is the basic. This is the first 10%. This is your tithe. Your tithe is your first 10%. This is hard, okay? Malachi 3, 7 to 10. I suggest you read all of Malachi 3 because this is an amazing chapter, but we're not going to read the whole thing. Just going to read 7 to 10. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? See, God and his people had a different perspective about where they were really at. This is what he says. Should people cheat God? You have cheated me. But you ask, what did you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, I love this says the Lord of the heaven's armies. I will open up the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You can't outgive God. But if you're withholding what's his, if you're withholding what he calls his, you may find yourself like the people of Israel who are totally clueless and under a curse because they had not been obeying him. That's a little scary. This is a challenge. They were cursed for not obeying. He considered it. Some translations say, you have been robbing me. But our tithe is just the basic. There's offerings. So be a giver and not a thief. We give to God what is his. We give to God what he asks. But there's more. You give to others. You love God and others with your treasure. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. Proverbs 11.24 and 25, Give freely 
and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. In other words, and I've heard this quote thrown around before, I will give to you as much as I can give through you. He loves generosity. Proverbs 14, 21, it is a sin to be little one's neighbor, but blessed are those who help the poor. How do we steward our treasure? We combat greed, number one. Number two, we are givers. Number three, I told you this was going to move fast. Number three, get out of debt. Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Pay your debt. It's wicked to borrow and not pay it back. We dishonor God by being stingy. We dishonor God by being poor managers. We dishonor God by breaking our word, by saying we're going we're gonna to take it and we're going to give it back, and then we don't. God calls that wicked. Proverbs 22, 7, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. When we're in debt, we are enslaved because we are bound to that which we owe. We're bound to the bank. We're bound to the person that we um, borrowed from. God doesn't want us to be enslaved. He doesn't want us to be enslaved by guilt. He doesn't want us to be enslaved by shame or sin. He doesn't want us to be enslaved by money. And he doesn't want us to be enslaved by debt. He wants us free, free to be generous, free to function fully in carrying out what he has given you to do. Because he has a good plan for your life and a good purpose for your life. And let's be honest, to do anything around here, it takes cash. And he wants you to be able to do what he's put in your heart to do. He doesn't want you to be a slave. So get out of debt. Number four, work. This is really deep stuff here. Thank you, Solomon. Work hard. Take a lessons from, lesson from the ants, Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. They don't have anyone telling them what to do, but day and night they work. They work storing for winter. Proverbs 13, 4. Lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. Proverbs 13, 11, Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappear, but wealth from hard work grows over time, little by little, with perseverance, with patience. It grows. Proverbs 10, 4, lazy people are soon poor, but hard workers get rich. But it's not just enough to work hard, because there's lots of good people who work hard and are not rich. They do not have a lot of wealth or a lot of treasure. So we also have to work smart. Got to work. You got to work hard. Got to work smart. Ecclesiastes 10, 10, using a dull axe requires great strength, great effort, also probably going to cause some injury. So sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. Abraham Lincoln is quoted as saying, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend four hours sharpening the axe. Planning, creativity, wisdom, understanding plays a part in success. Knowing what you're doing and how best to go about doing it. Not rushing in and being foolish. There's a little story I came across. It says, before going to Europe on, on business, a certain man drove his Rolls Royce to a downtown New York City bank and went to ask for an immediate loan of $5,000. The loan officer, taken aback, requested collateral. The man replied, well then, here are the keys to my Rolls Royce. The loan officer promptly had the car driven into the bank's underground parking for safekeeping and gave the man $5,000. Two weeks later, the man walked through the bank's doors and asked to settle up his loan and get his car back. That'll be $5,000 in principal and $15.40 in interest, the loan officer said. The man wrote a check, got up, and started to walk away. Wait, sir, the loan officer said. While you were gone, I found out you are a millionaire. Why in the world did you need to borrow $5,000? The man smiled. Where else could I safely park my Rolls Royce in Manhattan for two weeks? and only pay $15.40. Wisdom and ingenuity comes from God. The ability to work smart, the ability to see how you can do things, solutions, creativity, planning. Have you asked God 
for wisdom with your treasure. So go for it. Seize the opportunities. Ecclesiastes 11.14 says, Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. In Matthew 25, in the parable of the talents, the wicked servant was called wicked because he did nothing. He waited. He did nothing. He didn't act. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. For God's sake, do something. Even if it's just putting that money in the bank, at least you'll get interest. But go for it. Seize the day. Move. Act. Invest. Plant. Proverbs 31, I love this. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. And with the earnings, she plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread and her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. So we see that industriousness, the hard work, the investment, and the giving all wrapped up in what is called a virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. So you gotta work, you gotta work hard, you gotta work smart, and seize the opportunities. Number five, get good advice. Don't think you should just go it alone. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, without wise leadership a nation falls, but there is safety in having many advisors. And Proverbs 12, 15, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. No matter if you've been doing something for 30 years, no matter if you're the expert, there's still more to know. You can still be better. There's always more to learn. Proverbs 2, 3, and 4 says, cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would search for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Number six, plan. Plan. Don't just let the chips fall where they may. Plan. Save. Leave treasure for those coming after you. Set them up for success. Proverbs 13, 22 says, Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly plan and diversify can you believe this is in the bible diversify your investments friends don't put all your eggs in one basket nothing is guaranteed stuff happens tragedies happen things happen that we can't foresee but it's wisdom to take your wealth and put it in different places so if something bad happens you don't lose it all ecclesiastes 11:2 says invest in seven ventures yes in eight do you not know what disaster you do not know what disaster may come in the land. This is such practical advice, like for 2021. It doesn't even seem spiritual enough to be in the Bible, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Plan. Don't leave it to chance. Finally, principle number seven. Enjoy it. Don't feel guilty about having it. It is a gift. It is a tool, it is not evil, it is given to you to use. Ecclesiastes 3.12 says, So I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can, and people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of the, their labor, for these are gifts from God. These are gifts from God. Sometimes I think some of us maybe have looked at treasure and wealth suspiciously, felt guilty about having what we have, maybe not known what to do with it, maybe not known what the Bible says about wealth, about having wealth, about using wealth. Rich is generous. He's a generous guy. He sometimes buys, for me and for the kids, sometimes what I think are really extravagant gifts. And even if it's more than I would have spent on a gift, because that's not my love language. I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm really not a great gift giver. He is. It would be an ins insult to reject a gift given in love. 
it would be an insult to reject what he felt was a good gift and an appropriate amount to spend on a gift. So I just accept the gift. So I get excited when he buys something extravagant for the kids. It's a gift from a father to a child, from a husband to a wife. It's a good thing. It's a blessing. We don't want to reject the gifts that God has given us, whether they're treasures, whether it's wealth, whether it's abilities, whether it's family, whether it's relationships, whatever it is, we don't want to reject the gifts. Be free. Be free to accept and consider it a gift from God. Malachi 3 at the end of the chapter says, uh, verse 16 says, then those who feared the Lord, see, he rebuked them for cheating him. When did we cheat you? You cheated when you didn't tithe and give your offerings that I required of you. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other and the Lord listened to what they said. Those who feared the Lord, they had been rebuked. They have listened and now they're talking amongst themselves and God is listening to what they're saying. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Whether you have much treasure or little treasure, are you always considering the honor of his name with what you do with what you have? Are you considering how to honor him with your wealth? Are you considering him when you receive wealth? Are you thanking him with a grateful heart? God took notice of those who changed their minds and purpose to obey and to give to him. Then he says in verse 17, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And on the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. You might not see it here. It may look like the wicked are getting away with it, but they're not. The time may just not have come yet. You have permission, provided that you handle what you have with wisdom, to enjoy your material blessings as a gift from God. You shouldn't feel guilty for having it or apologetic for having it. Be free because God does not want you to be enslaved by debt or guilt. We don't love our treasure. We are not enslaved by it. We don't waste it. We're not lazy with it. We don't be foolish with it or impulsive or reckless. We follow these biblical principles from Solomon for getting wealth, for using it well, and it will be a blessing to you, and it will be a blessing to those around you, and it will be a blessing to the Lord. You will be able to do what's in your heart to do. You'll be a blessing to those that are needy. You'll be a blessing to the church, proclaiming and spreading and sharing the gospel, creating a place where people can gather. Mostly it honors God as you gladly steward the treasure he has given you. Love God as your greatest treasure and worship him with the rest. So God, we just come to you with gratitude. We come to you grateful for the material blessings that you have given us. And we ask you to follow your word. We thank you for Solomon. We thank you for his wisdom. We thank you for what you have written in your word. We thank you for 2,350 verses about handling wealth, about handling treasure. We thank you that you want to bless us. We thank you for your extravagant gifts. And we ask you for creativity. We ask you for wisdom. We ask you for strength. We ask you for help to follow these principles. To be able to use what's in our hands. We want to make it count. We've got this, whether it's a lot or whether it's little. Help us be faithful, whether it's a lot or whether it's little. And we trust that when we are faithful with little, you will give more. And because you give more, we will be able to do more. And on our doing, we can honor you. 
that people would see our good deeds and they would glorify you because they can see the good that we're doing, the love that we have, and the way we honor you. We don't want to be enslaved by guilt, by shame, by debt, by wealth. We want to be free, free to do as you have purposed and planned for us to do since before the creation of the world. So we thank you. We thank you for your good plans. We thank you for what you have put in our hands. And we just simply ask for wisdom to use it well. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to make an opportunity for you to do that right now. I know this is a practical word. This is like, you know, um, a money a money lesson is what it is, but this is the word of God because God cares about your eternal destiny, but he cares about your life. He cares about every aspect of your life, and he wants to take care of you. And by following him, you will have the best life, not the easiest. I cannot make that promise, but you will have the best life you could ever have by following Jesus. So I want to encourage you, if you're watching and you have not given your heart to Christ, I encourage you to do that right now. Today is the day of salvation. There is no better day to give your life to the Lord because we don't know about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we have right now. So would you just turn your attention to the Lord and tell him this simple thing, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you are so generous that you laid down your life for me. You paid the debt that I couldn't. And because you paid my debt, I can walk in freedom by accepting that payment. So I accept that. I accept this spiritual freedom that you bought for me. And my act of worship, my response to that is, thank you, Lord. Help me make my life count. I receive you, I accept you, and now I want to live for you. And I believe that one day I will be with you in eternity. And until then, help me make it count. If you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, we believe that everything has changed for you. That your eternal destiny is secured. That you are now right with God because of what Jesus did. And that your debts are freed. Maybe not the bank. You know, you'll have to talk to them about that. But there's seven principles that you can apply to work on that. But spiritually, you are free. And so we rejoice with you today. We thank God for you. We would love to hear about that. If that's what happened with you today, you can email us at info at BethelWPG.com. We would love to hear about it. We would love to support you. We would love to pray for you. We would just love to know what's going on with you. So God bless you. As we just turn one last time today in gratitude, to to the one who has made everything possible for us, to the one who has done everything for us. Amen. Let's worship together. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song and you never do. So I'll throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a
I've got just one move With my arms just wide I will worship Father, we give you our hearts, we give you our lives this morning. We are so grateful for what you've done and for who you are. Well, church, thanks for joining us this morning. We pray you have a blessed week. We'll see you again soon. God bless you.